So, welcome everybody to another lecture on design. Our last lecture, we covered design processes and the history of design. This session, we're going to be looking into the future, the future of design. Okay, so we touched briefly on 3D printing in the last lesson. I'm going to talk a little bit more about 3D printing as it is a revolution in manufacturing. So, 3D printing is an additive technology, an additive manufacturing process. So, it's building things by making layers building up, making layers and layers and layers and layers and layers. Previously, nearly all goods were produced by creating a mould and then injecting plastic into that mould or even glass, as we see that the, the Romans did, or ceramics. But this is really, really expensive. The, when you create an injection moulded good, you have to create a metal mould and that means you've got a big, big lump of metal like this and you have to use a CNC milling machine to cut into that mould and that's a very expensive process to create a mould for, for something as simple as this it could cost as much as $10,000 just to create the mould However, to produce one of these then is incredibly cheaply, maybe, maybe a fraction of a dollar, of a cent in cost, so you know, less than one cent. This means that mass production, the production of lots and lots of goods is only viable if you're paying for the initial moulding in the, the initial cost of milling and making the mould. So you have to be sure you're going to be able to make and sell thousands and thousands of items. So what happens if you don't sell thousands and thousands of items? Well, there's two things. There's the impact on the environment because there's hundreds of unused pieces of plastic that, that's been made. Think of the environmental impact, it's really negative. And there's also the cost to the producer, the manufacturer. They could go into administration, they could become bankrupt because they fail to, to recognise the demand, the, the amount of demand for their product. Now, with 3D printing, you can produce as many objects as you want. There is no mould. So if you, if you wanted to produce a hundred items, say, a small run, you could 3D print each one. You can easy, also easily edit them. You can make them very personal. In the future, 3D printing will enable, well, it enables designers now to to make an idea and to, to give their buyers, their customers, the choice to edit it exactly how they need it. And here, this is a prosthetic limb. So a prosthetic limb, well, can you think of anything more personal than one of your arms or one of your, one of your legs? There's no point mass producing prosthetic limbs because everybody's leg is slightly different in height, isn't it? So that would be a terrible idea. But with injection moulding, you can use, I'm um, sorry, with 3D printing, you can scan a limb and you can make it exact and then you can 3D print it. It isn't only prosthetic limbs. In 2012, there was a Belgian lady, very old, 83 years old, and they 3D printed a jawbone for her, an exact jawbone, how it was. So that's, so that's another example of a very personal product. 
and the future of 3D printing. It probably involves, well it will involve the 3D printing of organs. They've already 3D printed ears, ears that can be put on, sewed on to humans as it were. Um, you'll be able to take your own cells with your own DNA and create those cells and 3D print them up to create organs, to create lungs, heart. The, you can imagine maybe in the future we'll live to 200 years old and we'll have all new parts like an old like a Mercedes Benz in this city. Lots of very old with lots of different parts. My colleague, he called a 3D printer an infinity machine in that the possibilities are endless. It's an infinity factory. Now can you remember the Industrial Revolution that I spoke about yesterday? Yes. A horrible time to, to be working in those factories. Here's another image of a grim factory in England, no doubt Manchester or Birmingham. But modern factories, they utilise incredibly complex machinery, incredibly complex robots. Now, do you know where, within manufacturing, where robots were first used? In medical. Um, it wasn't medical. In fact, I mentioned a product yesterday that revolutionised mass production. Uh, uh, Henry T. Ford. The first was, car. Yes, the first car. Ford. Yeah, Ford, absolutely. So it was the production of cars that ultimately created the first um, manufacturing lines. And indeed, it was the production of cars that brought the first robots. In. We've come a long way since the Victorian workhouse, haven't we? This is a factory producing cars for Hyundai in Japan. And in fact, two decades ago, 20 years ago, robots in manufacturing, 90% of robots in manufacturing, manufacturing were, in, were in car factories, car making factories. Now it's 50%. Now, now robots are used in factories, all different processes. Making robots is very skilled and takes a lot of knowledge, a lot of mathematics. In fact, a robot has three parts. It's brain, it's brawn, and it's bones. So, its brain is its processor, and obviously, as technology has developed, processors have become extremely powerful and extremely small. If you have an iPhone or a modern uh, smartphone, it has an incredibly powerful processor, Some, a processor that would have been unfathomable. Um, 20 years ago, putting it into a device that that small. So that's its brain. It has its bones, which is essentially the skeleton, the mechanics, the way it works. Obviously, a human being, a Homo sapien, like we all are, we have incredibly complex skeletons. The the, the mechanics is, is beyond modern computers, oh, sorry, beyond modern machines for the moment. But that's the skeleton, so this would be the skeleton of this machine now. And it has its brawn. So its brawn, this is using hydraulics, so um, hydraulics to, to work. Its brawn is its ability to lift load, 
and its power. Do you, do you understand the word brawn? Brawn is like muscle, and that's what brawn is, okay? So, brain, bones, and brawn, okay? So, if the first robots were developed and utilised to be involved in car manufacturing, now robots are used all over the world for lots of very, very different reasons. They've become very mobile. Do you guys know what robot this is? What this is robot is doing? Do any of you know? Uh, what well, this is potentially a bomb. Oh. So what this robot is doing is it's, a, it's checking to see if it's a bomb, and then it will be, if it is a bomb, it will be able to, to deactivate the bomb. They have these in Iraq and in modern war zones where there's lots of landmines. They're assisted by robots. Because for the moment, robots do not have emotions. <laughs> so people, whereas humans are sentient, we live and we think, so it's a lot better that a machine gets blown up than a, <laughs> than a person trying to detonate it, of course. So this is a really good use for robots. They're not just confined to land now, though, robots. There's incredibly sophisticated robots that are underwater. This is a submarine and it's, it's checking a wreck. Um, there's, there was quite a high profile shipwreck in Greece a year ago and they have very sophisticated submarines checking the damage of the, of the ship as it was underwater. And of course, robots are now just confined to this earth. The most sophisticated robots in all the world are to be found on another planet. Mars. Have you seen this? Yes. The Mars Explorer. So we obviously now, as a species, managed to put a robot on Mars. It's really, really quite incredible. And in surgery, surgery robots are being used as assistants for surgeons. So more and more complex surgery is being conducted using, using robots on humans. So can you see how if you can print a, if you can print an organ, a heart, and you can and you can put it in human, and you can use very sophisticated robots to do surgery on you, technology is becoming more and more and more invasive. What I mean by invasive is it's coming into the human human domain. It's affecting our every single interaction with the world of technology. In fact, if you have an iPhone, I imagine many people interact more with a technology than they do their friends now. And indeed, technology is actually becoming people's friends. This is have you seen this before? Yes. This is this is um yeah a robot dog produced by Sony. It's two years old and already in Japan it's becoming lots of people's best friend. And Sony is a, a very sophisticated um, developed society with regards to technology and manufacturing. So. In fact, as I said earlier, um, perhaps 50% of robots in the entire world, and there's now a million robots are to actually be found in Japan. It's a huge amount. 
They're not only creating pets now though, Honda has produced the first robot that can actually kick a football. The, what has been the greatest struggle in development of humanoid robots, so robots that have human characteristics, is its balance. We have phenomenal balance. I can jump here on one leg, I can also catch a ball if it was thrown at me, so my, my vision and my sensory, you know, it's in your brain, you call it cerebulum, that's the bit that enables you to keep balance and, and move around and stay on your feet, as it were, and indeed, it's the, the balancing of a robot that has, has been the hardest thing by a long way. As a species, we've now managed to create robots that can walk. We're soon going to be able to artificially make replacement organs. Machines are doing surgery on us. We've now got technology with like our iWatch or even your phone with GPS so we can track all your movements, everything that you do in your day is being tracked by Google or Apple. Where, where are the limitations? What, what is the future? Facebook uses facial recognition software, so you don't even need to, a friend to tag you now to know it's you. There's facial recognition software. So, so how will this, how will this affect um, your day-to-day -day interactions as you, as you grow up? Do you know what this is? Google Glass. Google Glass, yes. Google Glass. yes. So, you even, even the most human, human interaction, a smile or a wink at somebody you fancy, that could well be that could well be changed with Google Glass. It's, it can take pictures, it can record information. Hell, you, maybe you won't even have to use your brain anymore because this will <laughs> be doing everything for you, all of your interactions. And do you know what this person has here? And there's now 10,000 people in the world who have microchips implanted in them. So in factories, in Germany, employees, um, and in banks even, you cannot get into the bank with a safe any, well there's a safe, but to open it, you need like to have a chip in your hand. Um, so it's, it's crazy, in, but this is the way life is going. It's technology, is taking over everything and it's going to change our interactions completely. Do you know what perhaps is responsible for, for development of technology and the way, rather than the development, the direction of that development, film. Film has played a huge, huge part in the way that the future is now. Um, this is obviously Terminator. Have you all seen Terminator? Yeah. Yeah. So here's a robot with um, a metal interior skeleton and human flesh on top of him. And certainly, this is how most people imagine robots, is it not? Is that when you, when you think of a human, when you think of a robot in 10 years, that you would perhaps see walking around, people envisage them as being in a human form. And that's essentially, as a result of films, it's in our consciousness that we think of, that we think of um, things in certain ways because we can associate with a film because we've already seen it and we can already thought about it. Okay. There's 
there's been two films, well, really one film in particular, a film from 1983 that has informed probably the, the future of design, or design futures, which is the, the term in the design world, and it's Blade Runner. Have any of you seen Blade Runner? Well, if you have not, I would watch it. It's one of my favourite films. It has a very young Harrison Ford in it. But it, it's, set, it's set in the future, and it's a very bleak, very horrible future, and people who are rich no longer live on Earth. They live on colonies on other planets, and the people who are working on these colonies and other planets are clones, they are essentially artificial humans, and the film is about the relations that homo sapiens have with, with people who are homo sapiens, but they've been artificially made and produced. And another film that has changed design futures significantly in recent years is Minority Report. Have any of you seen Minority Report? No. Well, Minority... No? Minority no. Report? Tom Cruise? Yes, no Tom Cruise. Yeah, it's got Tom Cruise in it. Well, anyway, this is a... This is a film, again, set in the future and it's a Steven Spielberg film, and he actually employed lots of thinkers, um, um, designers who worked in top firms. He employed them to imagine how design would be in the near future, and how interactions would be in the near future. And there's a lot from Minority Report that is now happening. So, here he is in front of a computer. When, when you're using a computer now, you have a, a mouse, perhaps, or a tracker pad. But perhaps in the future, it will not be like that at all. With things like Google Glasses, you can probably soon we'll be able to take cognitive information straight out of your brain and put it onto a computer screen. How is that interaction going to be happen? Here, it's imagined as a very expressive, almost performance. So it's called it's called motion um, motion computing. And in fact, the company that was employed to think up of this, think this new way of of interacting with computers, he developed. He founded a company called Lead, Lead Motion, and they are developing all of the things out of this film for real now. And they're not far away already. This is this is one of their products. So without touching the without touching a, a pad, it it uses imaging software to capture all of your fingertips so you'll no longer have to actually touch keys you can just do this you can type perhaps in space maybe you can use maybe you can think of a word maybe no longer in 10 years you'll ever have to type again maybe a device will understand what your thoughts are and, and type for you what, what are the obvious dangers of this, though, is that, um, is that machines are encroaching. That where, where, when does some, someone stop being human and becoming a machine? Is, is that possible? If you, if you have a machine heart, a machine brain, you're a, a machine man. This is, <laughs> this is quite possible. Um, Another, another um, big technology that's in Minority Report, it's iris sensing technology. So 
This being that a camera, as you walk in, it can capture your eye and see exactly who you are. And there's companies in America now that have iris scanning technology. So they, again, it's for um, companies that have rooms where only very, very important people could go in. So you have to stand there and they scan your eye. In, in, even in, um, when you're going to Thailand, they scan your eye now at the airport to see if, you're, to see if um, you are who you say you are in your passport. Now this, this means that shopping habits could change significantly because you no, no longer perhaps are an individual with your, with your own freedom who nobody knows. You can, if they can scan your eye and Google and Apple know all of your consumer habits, everything that you do, everything that you're interested in, companies soon will likely be able to discreetly, without you even knowing, scanning your eye and know everything about you. And they could, if it was a big shop, they could use, have systems to guide you to the places where you're most likely to spend the most money on a product, because that's the point of a shop, is trying to get you to spend your money there. So th this is going to be um, changing the way we behave significantly. This is actually Dolly the sheep. Do you know why this sheep is very famous? Because it was the first cloned mammal. And that was in 1996. So, so there you have it. Now, have you guys heard of touch points? Touch points. So, a touch point is a point during a journey in which you as an individual, as a consumer or a customer, come into contact with a service, a brand or a product. Okay? So, when you think about designing a product or an experience, what you have to do is you have to understand the whole journey of that consumer. Okay? So a bank would spend a lot of money on understanding and mapping every touch point of a customer. Do, do any of you go to the bank? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Do you have a cash machine? Yeah. yeah? yeah. So think of all of the times when you have a cash machine card that you interact with that, with that brand. You're, you perhaps walk into a bank how does the door open? Do you have to manually no. open it's it? Automatically. Yeah, it just opens for you. Yeah. So that's probably your first interaction when you walk into a bank. For your bank, the door opens for you. That makes you feel great, doesn't it? Yeah. Don't have to, you don't have to open the door. And that's been designed to make you feel comfortable. It's a conscious thing, so as so as you feel like a valued customer the minute you interact with the bank because the door is opening for you. And then what would perhaps be the next thing you would do when you go into a bank? Get in the line. Yeah. You would, would you go and queue in the line? Does, is there normally somebody there to welcome you? Yeah, there's normally someone there to welcome you. So that's another touch point, is you've, you've walked in and then somebody's welcome, welcoming you. 
So that's a, another place in which the, in this case, service provider, a bank, and that's a service provider, can develop their brand and the strength of their loyalty customers by just giving a warm welcome. Okay? And then, and then you would queue. You would queue. Now, I'm not entirely sure how you make queuing much better, but uh, it's, certainly a, it's certainly a touch point. So supermarkets, they try and keep queues to a minimum by employing the right amount of people to work on the tills to keep queues to a minimum. Because if, if there's huge queues, people stop going to, going to that supermarket, they'll go somewhere else. So th this is just thinking about, again, how the customer experience would be. And then you would perhaps go and you would withdraw money. You would perhaps use one of their, you would, that would mean you'd maybe take your card out of your product, out of your pocket. That card has been designed by that bank. It feels a certain way. Um, you know, they all, they all feel the same, but it's, it feels good, doesn't it, a credit card? Well, only when you have money, I guess. Um, there's nothing more depressing than having a card without any money on it, is there? But, <laughs> but all of these are touch points. Okay, so what do I want you to do for this short task is to, while you're all in groups, you're in a group of three, you're all in groups of three, I want you to think about your journey to this class today. Think, did most, have most of you come from home? Yes. Yeah, straight to here from home, yeah? So what I want you to do is I want you to, in groups, think about it. And then I want you to draw a diagram, just a line and then a circle and explain this interaction that you've had and then, and then the next. All of the touch points that you have experienced from the moment you left your door to the moment you arrived here. Think, think about what the touch points are and then I want you to think about how perhaps two significant touch points will change, or how you think they may change for the year 2050. Okay? Yeah?